Suzanne was 25 years old when she came to hospital for routine minor hand surgery. The anaesthetist came to see her on the ward, uh, took a history and examined her. She was a little bit overweight. She suffered from occasional indigestion and she had mild diabetes, but it was well controlled. And the anaesthetist listed her as ASA2. She agreed with the anaesthetist that she'd have her surgery performed under a local anaesthetic brachial plexus block and the anaesthetist went off to theatre to start his list. It was about half past three that afternoon when Suzanne came down to theatre and the block was performed with 40 mils of a mixture of lignocaine and bupivacaine. But after about 20 minutes it was clear that the block wasn't going to be good enough for surgery and the anaesthetist decided to have to send her off to sleep to have her operation done. So about five to four after routine pre-oxygenation, propofol, muscle relaxant, and he just looked in, and all he could see was the epiglottis. He couldn't see the cords, and he couldn't get a tube in. Ventilation was a bit awkward, but it was okay at that stage, so he repositioned the pillow, had another look in, anaesthetic nurse did some laryngeal pressure to try and improve the view, but still couldn't get a tube in. About two minutes in, ventilation was becoming a bit more difficult, the sats were beginning to drift a bit, so he called for help. Uh, and then he had one more go at intubating, this time using a bougie. But he couldn't get the bougie in, uh, and he couldn't pass the tube. It was about a minute later, help arrived, a consultant anaesthetist from the theatre next door. Um, and by that stage, Suzanne was desaturating. She was difficult to ventilate. And between them, they tried four-handed bag mask ventilation. Sats still not good and it was difficult to ventilate her, so they put in a disposable laryngeal mask for rescue, but that actually made ventilation worse, so they took it out and went back to four-handed bag mask ventilation. About five minutes in, a second consultant anaesthetist arrived from the main theatre block about 200 yards away. And when he got there, Suzanne was obviously blue. She'd gone very bradycardic. They'd given atropine, they were doing cardiac massage to try and keep her cardiac output going. And that anaesthetist had a look in um, to try and intubate. He noticed that the airway was swollen and he couldn't see because of blood and secretions. It was about 16 minutes later, it was about quarter past four, when one of the anaesthetists finally got a tube in. Her sats were down at 44%. Um, they could finally get some oxygen in, but her saturations only came up to just above 50. And it was at that point that they decided they'd have to abandon surgery. And Suzanne was transferred to intensive care with suspected brain damage. On its own, that's a sort of harrowing case report, but over the one year reporting period of the NAP4 project, we heard 184 stories, like Suzanne's, of death, brain damage, emergency surgical airway, and critical care admission. So in the UK, that's more than three people a week, every week, with serious complications of airway management. A lot of speakers, when I go and see speakers talk, they start with a place, a picture of the place where they came from. I don't normally do that, but I thought I'd break with tradition. That's my mum, Barbara Freut. <laughs> That's where I came from. Anyway, um, so I'd like to thank Chris Acott for inviting me over here. He says, thank you for joining us on our March on our airway conference. Uh, we were going to discuss the NAP4 findings. Now we can have it from the horse's mouth. That'll be me, the horse. I'll be delighted if your talk could cover the NAP4 process, data obtained, three to five most important lessons, in my opinion, what implications it has, and will have for UK airway training. Please, 30 minutes. Regards, Chris A. So, 30 minutes. Three years, the project thereabouts, 216 pages the report runs to. It's 184 cases, as I said, and there's about 170 recommendations. I'm not gonna cover all of that in 30 minutes, or 26 minutes, whatever I've got now. So, this is a pied de it's a tasting menu from a London restaurant in Fitzrovia, where the chef doles out five of his favorite dishes, or seven of his favorite dishes, in the hope that you'll come back to the restaurant and try it again. So, I'm a bit like one of the NAP4 chefs today. I'm gonna to be giving you just a little bit of a tasting menu about the NAP4 report in the hope that you'll come back and have a look at the whole report sometime in the future. So the NAP4 process, I think it really started back in about 1999. There was a passing comment from Adrian Pierce, who's an airway anesthetist in the UK at an airway meeting, and he said, you know, do you think that there's a problem with cricothyroidotomies? Do you think we actually do any in the UK? Perhaps we should do a survey. Um, and we did nothing about it apart from mould it over. And in 2003, 2005, Nick Woodall, who's one of the co-editors of the report, tried to do a, a sort of a replica of the American closed claims studies in the UK, uh, talking to the defence unions, the National Health Service Litigation Authority, and individual trusts, 
trying to get data about airway complications, but it was very difficult to get any sort of meaningful data. And so we decided if we were going to try and get that, we'd have to do it prospectively. And in 2006, I was just at a general uh, education meeting at the College of Anaesthetists and happened to bump into the president and said, you know, should we try and do a joint survey between the Difficult Airway Society and the college looking at airway complications? And over about six months of negotiation, NAP4 was born. And really, that's when the hard work started. Tim Cook in 2007 managed to get all the NHS hospitals in the UK signed up to the project with a local reporter in each hospital. And they were really key to the project in terms of providing data from their own hospitals uh, so that we could look at it centrally. So it was a two-part project. The first part was looking at how many anaesthetics there were given each year in the UK. We couldn't get that data from anywhere, surprisingly. Um, and each local reporter in the hospitals collected data for a census period. Some collected it manually on paper. Some had hospital systems that would record it. But the information was then sent centrally and collated. And we were able to work out that there are about 2.9 million anaesthetics given each year in the UK. That's just in the NHS. There's a few more, uh, probably another 10 or 20% given in the private sector. And we asked the local reporters for data about what sort of airway devices were being used. Superglottic airways in just over half the cases, endotracheal tubes in 40%, and face masks in about 5%. And there's more detail on that in the project report. And the second part of the project was to look at how many serious complications of airway management there were each year in the UK. So death, brain damage, emergency surgical airway, or unanticipated ICU admission. Anyone could report a case. So the anaesthetist responsible could report a case, or an anaesthetist in the department who'd heard about it could report it. A surgeon, anaesthetic nurse, even a patient or a patient's relatives could report a case. So we hoped that we'd capture the majority of stuff that was going on in the UK. And they all went to a central drop email box um, based at the college. And then the local reporters from that hospital were contacted to confirm that an event had happened. And then either the local reporter or the anaesthetist involved would fill in an online form that was anonymous, we didn't know where it had come from, with details of the case, so there's lots of drop-down menus with particular questions and space for free text so that we could get an idea of what had happened. All the cases were reviewed by a review panel, uh, anaesthetists, surgeons, lay people, nurses, um, people from the National Patient Safety Agency, critical care doctors, emergency department doctors. So a real multidisciplinary panel looked at all the cases. And what we found was we had 133 cases reported um, from general anaesthesia in the UK that met the criteria for inclusion in the study. And when you divide that by 2.9 million, we get an instance of one in 22,000 anaesthetics. Because of the way the data came in, we could be fairly sure that we've missed some cases, and the instance may be as high as one in 5,000, but it's certainly no lower than one in 22,000. And we also got 51 cases reported from emergency departments and ICUs. So the review panel looked at all those cases. We were able to identify themes, uh, generate learning points, and make recommendations. And they form the basis of the NAP4 report. But because there are so many recommendations, you look at it, and like Chris says, when you want to put it into practice, it's difficult to know where to start. And I think the place to start is with the report itself. It's freely available online. You can go and have a look. And although it's 216 pages, it's quite a daunting thing to start with. It's broken down into what we consider to be fairly easy to read bite-sized chapters. So there's chapters on ICU, on training, head and neck, obesity, pediatrics, obstetrics, human factors, and lots of others. So if you look at your own areas of practice, your own areas of interest, there's almost certainly going to be a chapter in there for you. Just pick one. Have a look at the recommendations. See how they could apply to your own practice or to your own hospital. And that's a good place to start. But Chris Acott hasn't had me flown all the way out here just to tell you to go on the internet and have a look at the report for yourself. So my top five tasting menu dishes from NAP4. <coughs> First one, most pervasive for me throughout the report was lack of a plan B for an ESIS. So we must always, always have a, a full airway management strategy. The area that the panel felt could save most lives in the UK was to always use capnography in critical care. We should be using more second generation superglottic airway devices, and I'll talk about that in a moment. An aspiration 
biggest cause of mortality in the NAP4 report. We're not doing enough to protect our patients from aspiration. And finally, because I'm here, I feel I've got to talk about CICV um, and the emergency surgical airway. I'm going to start with that one and then go back to the, the top of the list of my favourite dishes. So we go back to 1999, Adrian Pierce's question, CICV, is it a problem in the UK? Does it really happen? Best estimates were maybe 10 a year in the UK. We got reports of 80 in a year. And the headline that I'm sure you're all aware of was the high failure rate of our rescue techniques in the UK. So 63% of attempts to rescue with a needle and jet ventilation failed, and 43% of attempts with a wide bore cannula, four millimetres or over, failed. And striking to the panel and to the readers of the report was that surgical access to the airway with a knife was always successful in accessing the trachea. It didn't always save the patient. There were cases with tumour or blood or other things obstructing the trachea further down, but it was always successful in accessing the trachea. And so people often say, they said at the launch day, why is it, why didn't you recommend that we should just abandon cannula cryothyroidotomy? And the answer was because we tried to make all our recommendations just based on the evidence that we had rather than our own you know, particular prejudices perhaps. And when there wasn't evidence to say that we should be abandoning it, what we did recommend was that alongside cannula cryothyroidotomy, we should be teaching and learning a surgical technique. And the specific recommendations are that all anaesthetists should be trained in emergency cryothyroidotomy, keep our skills up to date. We should be learning a surgical technique as well. But most importantly, perhaps, that we need to be looking at the research, uh, doing some research, finding out why in the UK our failure rate is so high. Is it to do with our decision-making skills? Is it to do with the equipment that we're using, the way it's taught, or how often we keep our skills up to date? We don't know the answer to those questions, but we need to try and find out. The other thing that came out of the report for CICV for me, as a sort of standout recommendation, was that even if it hasn't been part of our original plan, to use a muscle relaxant, in early CICV, if we can't wake the patient up, then we should be giving a muscle relaxant to make sure that the obstruction isn't at the level of the vocal cords. We saw a number of cases where people proceeded, did an emergency surgical airway, but it was quite apparent later that if they'd given a muscle relaxant, that could have been avoided. So, I say probably my, my top recommendation for me is to always, always have a full airway management strategy. We saw cases where people hadn't got plan Bs so often, it was amazing. We saw cases where anaesthetist plan A failed and they asked for a piece of kit and it wasn't available. We saw cases where the plan A failed and the ODP or anaesthetic nurse gave them a piece of kit and they didn't know how to use it. So for, our, for the unanticipated difficult intubation, the recommendation is really quite straightforward and it says all anaesthetic departments should have an explicit policy for managing this, and in the UK that would be adoption of the Difficult Airway Society guidelines. They've been around since 2004, but we still saw people having seven, eight, nine attempts at tracheal intubation, and then going on serious patient harm. So we just need to enable people to use the guidelines that are out there. But perhaps more relevant, or more interesting for the audience here, is in the anticipated difficult airway. There are quite a lot of he head and neck cases uh, reflected in the report. And plan A was always obvious, but often there wasn't a very well-defined plan B. And we discovered that there was no one safe anaesthetic technique. We saw cases where people were having a gas induction, and they had a gas induction which continued until the patient obstructed and they died. We saw cases where people had intravenous induction of anaesthesia and muscle relaxant, and they had continued attempts at tracheal intubation until they came to serious harm. We saw uh, cases where the plan A involved some of the new toys or fibro optic laryngoscopy and the plan A failed and there wasn't a robust plan B in place. So there often wasn't a plan B and if there wasn't a plan B there almost certainly wasn't a plan C. So it's no, I don't think it ever was, but it certainly isn't acceptable now to say I've got a patient with a dental abscess, I'm going to do a gas induction. That's not good enough. You've got to say what you're going to do if, if you do your gas induction and you're looking at laryngoscopy and you can't see the cords, okay, okay I'll wake the patient up. But what happens if the patient obstructs their airway? I'll put a laryngeal mask in. Okay, what happens if the airway isn't clear then? I'll give them a muscle relaxant. Okay, and if that still doesn't work, I'll get the surgeon to do a crike. 
do you know where the surgeon is? So I haven't got anything against gas induction, but you have to work out what you're going to do with each stage of your plan if it doesn't work. Because what we found is that in those complex cases, the head and neck cases and in others, all techniques will fail occasionally. And so the successful management depends on having not just a plan, but we heard it yesterday, a series of plans. You've got to have all your equipment available. The rest of the team need to know what you're going to do. And if it involves the surgeon, the surgeon's got to know what he's going to do if he's your plan D for rescue. So you've got to have a complete airway management strategy. Okay, capnography and critical care, as I say, the area where the panel felt that most lives could be saved in the UK. It's a standard of care in theatres, has been for a long time. If you've got a capnograph trace, you're ventilating the lungs. If you haven't got a capnograph trace, you're not. We saw lots of cases from critical care where the use of capnography could have detected problems earlier and prevented patient harm. Uh, and we're very pleased, following the NAP4 report, that the various associations in the UK, the Association of Anesthetists Great Britain and Ireland, the Intensive Care Society, the European Board, have come online with their recommendations saying that continuous capnography in all patients in critical care is the standard of care that we should be striving for. I don't do critical care anymore. Uh, I'm not on call for it at night. We didn't used to have capnography in our ICU in Northampton. But since the report came out, I've spoken to the guys in our ICUs there, and we do now. If you haven't got it in your ICUs and your home hospitals, you should be getting it in there. Uh, second generation superglottic airways. That's the second generation superglottic airway. The difference between these and the first generations is they've got a drain tube uh, which sits over the top of the esophagus so you can vent gas and fluid out through, the, out through the drain tube. They've got improved cuff seals so that you can get a better functional separation of respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. And they've got an integral bite block so that if the patient is biting down on the uh, superglottic airway during emergence, they don't include the airway. That's the Supreme, which is a disposable version. Uh, and that's the eye gel, which is into surgical's disposable version. So there was one patient in the report who was 120 kilos. He was going to have a spontaneous breathing anaesthetic. And the anaesthetist was going to use an eye gel. But then he discovered he'd got caps and bridge work. So he decided he didn't want to disrupt the caps and bridge work. So he used just an ordinary laryngeal mask. And the case went absolutely fine. In recovery, the patient bit down on his laryngeal mask, completely occluded his airway, saturations down in the 40s needed emergency intubation in the recovery unit. Got post-obstructive pulmonary edema, uh, needed ventilation on critical care for a few days with positive end expiratory pressure and vasoactive drugs. So, you know, decision is yours. His caps and crowns were absolutely fine, you know. <laughs> and I sort of remember when, when we were coming to the, our views on second generation superglottic airways, the, on the very first day of the review panel, the first two or three cases that we saw were cases that had laryngeal masks in. And a couple of the panel were saying, you know, perhaps we should recommend more tracheal tubes. And then the next two or three cases were patients who had tracheal tubes as their primary plan. And other people going, well, perhaps we should recommend more laryngeal masks. And it became clear very quickly that, that there is a sort of alternative, an intermediate uh, option. And that if tracheal intubation isn't indicated, but, you know, you're a big guy, you've got a hiatus hernia, but you're asymptomatic on proton pump inhibitors, then a second generation device is a more logical choice than a first one. Or if you're planning to use a laryngeal mask for your anaesthetic, but it's at the limits of its performance, so you're going to ventilate them, uh, they're head down, they're in lithotomy, they've got a high BMI, then again, a second generation device is a more logical choice than a first one. That's changed my practice. So now I've got to ask you, in your hospitals, who, it's a show of hands, is there anybody here who doesn't have access to one of these devices regularly? Any day that they choose, they could use a pro seal or an eye gel. Have you all got them in your hospitals or is there anyone who works somewhere that hasn't got them? That's pretty good. Either your arms are paralyzed or Australia and New Zealand are fab places. In the UK, there's about 50% of hospitals don't have second generation devices that they could use routinely. Perhaps more importantly then, if you've got them in your hospital but you're not using them, that's even worse because you could be using them, you just choose not to. So if you've got them in your hospitals but you don't use them very much, find out what the indications are, get someone to show you how to use them because they're slightly different and use them when it's indicated to do so. Uh, and finally, on this aspiration, I say it was the biggest killer in the 1950s in anaesthesia and it's still the biggest cause of mortality from airway problems today. Um, 
I think you know, if I'm doing an appendix or a bowel obstruction, it's no problem. I'll do a rapid sequence induction. But if you think what you're going to do, you've got a person with a fractured forearm, they're going for a K wiring or an MUA the next day. Do you do a rapid sequence still? I don't know. Well, you've got to chat with a perineal abscess. He's a little bit overweight. Um, he's been quite sore. He's been having some morphine. Do you do a rapid sequence? It's trying to work out what is the risk of aspiration. If you're not sure of the risk of aspiration, you should always make an assessment of it, but assume that the risk is at the higher end rather than the lower end and choose an appropriate airway management strategy. That may be a rapid sequence. It may be a second generation supraglottic device. It may be an ordinary tracheal tube without a rapid sequence. So CICV I'd talked about, and this one, my favorite. So we've always, always got to have an airway management strategy. I'm just going to finish with a story. Remember my mum, Barbara? She's like a silver surfer. She's good at the internet. She's really chuffed with her son. So she's been to the NAP4 website. And she found this, which is the list of podcasts that you can go to. It's all open access. You don't need passwords. You don't need a subscription. Anyone can go to it. I was hoping she'd have looked at the whole report, but of course, because you know, she's my mum, she just looked at my podcast. So you can see podcasts of all the people, give, the people on the panel giving their own reports. So if you don't want to read it, you just click on the site and you can see a 10 minute presentation about all the chapters in there. This is Mary. That's my mum's sister. She immigrated to Australia about 20 years ago. I haven't seen her for eight, well, I haven't seen her for 20 years. And my mum rung her up and she goes, you know, our Christopher, he's on the internet, you can see him. So Mary went on the website and she had a look. She said, I look like my dad, which I thought was quite nice. Um, about two weeks later, she got taken into hospital and she needed an operation. She went to the anaesthetic room and the anaesthetist came and he said, my nephew, Chris Ferg, he, he wrote some of that nap for, you know. You're looking after my airway, aren't you? If your plan A doesn't work, have you got a plan B? <laughs> so... Thank, thanks very much, Mary. And the niece is sort of like, don't worry, you know, I always have a plan B. And so she went to sleep relaxed. So it's, it's nice that anesthetists can actually relate to their, their patients. She wrote to me a couple of weeks ago and she said, um, here we go, is that a bit sort of it? There. Did Bob, Barbara, this moment, did Bob tell you that the anesthetist knocked out my remaining top teeth? So now there's nowhere to hang my expensive metal dentures. I'm going for some impressions tomorrow. Said anesthetist came to see me the next day and apologised and said they had to press on my mouth. Good wishes, please let me know the dates of your visit. I'm going to see her next week, she's fine. This isn't to have a go at this anaesthetist because none of the anaesthetists who were involved in the cases in the NAP4 report were bad people, bad anaesthetists. They just got overwhelmed by events on the day. And it was the same for this anaesthetist. I don't suppose knocking her teeth out really was a plan B. Could have been, but... <laughs> if it, even if it was, what was plan C if that hadn't worked? And while it's important that we reassure patients, we like to reassure our anaesthetic nurses and ourselves. We say, I'll do a gas induction, I'm sure it'll be okay. What we really need to be doing is saying, if this doesn't work, I'm gonna do this. And if that doesn't work, I'm gonna be doing the next thing. We saw that throughout the NAP4 report. We need a complete airway management strategy. So summary, we should always be using capnography in critical care for intubation and for all patients on mechanical ventilation. We should be using more second generation supraglottic airways. We've got to do better to protect our patients from aspiration. And CICV, we need to learn a surgical technique. We need to think to give a muscle relaxant if, if, it's, if we've got a CICV and wake up isn't an option. And I say, Google NAP4, pick a chapter, uh, and look at the recommendations there. But always, always have an airway strategy. I think at least we owe that to Suzanne and the 183 other people whose stories made up the NAP4 report. Thank you very much.